Our story of civilization so far has been dominated by Mesopotamia and Egypt, but significant developments were also taking place on the fringes of these civilizations. Farming had spread into the Balkan Peninsula of Europe by 6500 BCE, and by 4000 BCE, it was well established in southern France, central Europe, and the coastal regions of the Mediterranean. Although migrating farmers from the Anatolian Peninsula may have brought some farming techniques into Europe, some historians believe that the Neolithic peoples, or New Stone peoples of Europe, domesticated animals and began to farm largely on their own. One outstanding feature of late Neolithic Europe was the erection of megaliths. Megalith, as you might know, is Greek for large stone. Radiocarbon dating, a technique that allows scientists to determine the age of objects, shows that the first megalithic structures, or large stone structures, were constructed around 4000 BCE, more than a thousand years before the Great Pyramids were built in Egypt. Between 3200 and 1500 BCE, standing stones placed in circles or lined up in rows were erected throughout the British Isles of northwestern France. Other megalithic constructions have been found as far north as Scandinavia and as far south as the islands of Corsica, Sardinia, and Malta. Archaeologists have demonstrated that these stone circles were used as observatories to detect not only such simple astronomical phenomena as the midwinter and midsummer sunrises, but also such sophisticated phenomena as the major and minor standstills of the moon. Nomadic Peoples Impact of the Indo-Europeans On the fringes of civilization lived nomadic peoples who depended on hunting and gathering, herding, and sometimes a bit of farming for their survival. Most important were the pastoral nomads who, on occasion, overran civilized communities and forged their own empires. Pastoral nomads domesticated animals for both food and clothing, and moved along regular migratory routes to provide steady sources of nourishment for their animals. The Indo-Europeans were among the most important nomadic peoples. These groups of Indo-Europeans spoke languages derived from a single parent tongue. Indo-European languages include Greek, Latin, Persian, Sanskrit, and the Germanic and Slavic tongues. The original Indo-European speaking peoples were probably based in the steppe region north of the Black Sea or in southwestern Asia, in modern Iran or Afghanistan, but around 2000 BCE they began to move into Europe, India, and western Asia. The domestication of horses and the importation of the wheel and wagon from Mesopotamia facilitated the Indo-European migrations to other lands. Again, the original Indo-European speaking peoples were probably based um, in southwestern Asia and modern Iran or Afghanistan, but they eventually, uh, by 2000 BCE, began to move into Europe, India, and western Asia. The Hittites was one group of Indo-Europeans who moved into Asia Minor and Anatolia, also known as modern Turkey, around 1750 BCE, and they coalesced with the native peoples to form the Hittite Kingdom, with its capital at Hattusha. Bagazkoi in modern Turkey. Between 1600 and 1200 BCE, the Hittites formed their own empire in Western Asia and threatened the power of the Egyptians. The Hittites were the first of the Indo-European peoples to make use of iron, enabling them to construct weapons that were stronger and cheaper to make because of the widespread availability of iron ore. During its height, the Hittite empire also demonstrated an interesting ability to assimilate other cultures into its own culture. In language, literature, art, law, and religion, the Hittites borrowed much from the Mesopotamians as well as from the native peoples that they had subdued. Recent scholarship has stressed the important role of the Hittites in transmitting Mesopotamian culture as they transformed it to later civilizations in the Mediterranean area, especially to the Mycenaean Greeks. <coughs> From their probable homeland in the steppe region north of the Black Sea, Indo-European-speaking peoples moved eventually into Europe, India, and Western Asia. The languages shown on are all Indo-European languages. Think about Celtic, Italic, Hellenic, Slavic, Germanic, Celtic, Persian, Sanskrit. Territorial states in Western Asia. 
the Phoenicians. During its heyday, the Hittite Empire was one of the great powers in Western Asia. Constant squabbling over succession to the throne, however, tended to weaken royal authority at times. Especially devastating, however, were attacks by the Sea Peoples from the West and aggressive neighboring tribes. By 1190 BCE, Hittite power had come to an end. The destruction of the Hittite kingdom and the weakening of Egypt around 1200 BCE left no dominant powers in Western Asia, allowing a patchwork of petty kingdoms and city-states to emerge, especially in the area of Syria and Canaan. The Phoenicians were one of these peoples. A Semitic-speaking people, the Phoenicians lived in an area of Canaan along the Mediterranean coast on a narrow band of land about 120 miles long. Their newfound political independence after the demise of the Hittite and Egyptian power helped the Phoenicians expand the trade that was already the foundation of their prosperity. The chief cities of Phoenicia, Byblos, Tyre, and Sidon were ports on the eastern Mediterranean, but they also served as distribution centers for the lands to the east in Mesopotamia. The Phoenicians themselves produced a number of goods for foreign markets, including purple dye, glass, wine, and lumber from the famous cedars of Lebanon. In addition, the Phoenicians improved their ships and became great international sea traders. They charted new routes, not only in the Mediterranean, but also in the Atlantic Ocean, where they reached Britain and then sailed south along the west coast of Africa. The Phoenicians established a number of colonies in the western Mediterranean, including settlements in southern Spain, Sicily, and Sardinia. Carthage, the Phoenicians' most famous colony in North Africa, was also located on the north coast. Culturally, the Phoenicians are best known as transmitters. Instead of using pictographs or signs in order to represent whole words and symbols, as the Mesopotamians and Egyptians did, the Phoenicians simplified their writing by using 22 different signs to represent the sounds of their speech. These 22 characters or letters could be used to spell out all the words in the Phoenician language. Although the Phoenicians were not the only people to invent an alphabet, theirs would have special significance because it was eventually passed on to the Greeks. From the Greek alphabet was derived the Roman alphabet that we still use today. The Phoenicians achieved much while independent, but they ultimately fell subject to the Assyrians and the Persians. To the south of the Phoenicians lived another group of Semitic-speaking people known as the Hebrews. Although they were a minor factor in the politics of the region, their monotheism, the belief in one God, later influenced both Christianity and Islam, and flourished as a world religion in its own right. The Hebrews had a tradition concerning their origins and history that was eventually written down as part of the Hebrew Biblos, known to Christians as the Old Testament. Describing them as a nomadic people, the Hebrews' own tradition states that they were descendants of the patriarch Abraham, who had migrated from Mesopotamia to the land of Canaan, where the Hebrews became identified as the children of Israel. Moreover, according to tradition, a drought in Canaan caused many Hebrews to migrate to Egypt, where they lived peacefully, until they were enslaved by pharaohs who used them as laborers on building projects. The... Hebrews remained in bondage until a man by the name of Moses apparently led his people out of Egypt in the well-known Exodus, which some historians believe occurred in the first half of the 13th century BCE. But nevertheless, according to the biblical account, the Hebrews then wandered for many, many years in the desert until they entered Canaan. Organized into 12 tribes, the Hebrews became embroiled in conflict with the Philistines, who had settled along the coast of Canaan, but were beginning to move inland. Many scholars today doubt that the biblical account reflects the true history of the early Israelites. Uh, they argue that the early books of the Bible, written centuries, of course, after the events described, preserve only that the Israelites came to believe about themselves, and that recent archaeological evidence often contradicts the details of the biblical account. And so, the biblical account is only what is preserved in relation to what the Israelites came to believe about themselves, not actually what they um, were. But in any case, uh, they wanted to find an identity, and so they wrote it down. So some of these scholars have even argued that the Israelites were not nomadic invaders, but indigenous peoples in the Canaanite hill country. Uh, they were originally polytheistic. 
Uh, what is generally agreed, however, is that between 1200 and 1000 BCE, the Israelites emerged as a distinct group of people, possibly organized into tribes or a league of tribes. Was there ever a united kingdom of Israel? Well, according to the Hebrew Bible, the Israelites established a united kingdom of Israel, beginning with Saul, around 1020 to 1000 BCE, who supposedly achieved some success in the ongoing struggle with the Philistines. But after his death, a brief period of anarchy ensued until one of Saul's lieutenants, a man by the name of David, around 1000 to 970 BCE, reunited the Israelites, defeated the Philistines, and established control over all of Canaan. Among David's conquerors, among David's conquest was the city of Jerusalem, which he supposedly made into the capital of the United Kingdom. According to the biblical account, David's son Solomon, around 7, 9, uh, 970 to 930 BCE, did even more to strengthen royal power. He expanded the political and military establishments and extended the trading activities of the Israelites. Solomon is portrayed as a great builder, a sage, who was responsible for the temple in the city of Jerusalem. The Israelites viewed the temple as the symbolic center of their religion and hence of the kingdom of Israel itself. Under King Solomon, ancient Israel supposedly reached the height of its power. The accuracy of the account, however, of the United Kingdom of Israel under Saul, David, and Solomon has recently been challenged by a new generation of archaeologists and historians. Although they most, mostly accept Saul, David, and Solomon as potential historical figures, they view them more as chief warlords than as kings. If a kingdom of Israel did exist during these years, it was not as powerful or as well organized as the Hebrew Bible says it, that it was. Furthermore, there is no definitive archaeological evidence that Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. The Kingdoms of Israel and Judah There may or may not have been a united kingdom of Israel, but after the death of Solomon, tensions between northern and southern tribes in Israel led to the establishment of two separate kingdoms. The Kingdom of Israel, composed of the ten northern tribes, with its capital eventually at Samaria, and the southern kingdom of Judah, consisting of two tribes with its capital at Jerusalem. In 722 or 721 BCE, the Assyrians destroyed Samaria, overran the kingdom of Israel, and deported many Hebrews to other parts of the Assyrian Empire. These dispersed Hebrews, the ten lost tribes, emerged with neighboring peoples, and then gradually lost their identity through the assimilation with other cultures. The southern kingdom of Judah, however, was forced to pay tribute to Assyria, but managed to retain its independence as Assyrian power declined. A new enemy, however, appeared on the horizon. The Chaldeans defeated Assyria, conquered the kingdom of Judah, and completely destroyed Jerusalem in the year 586 BCE. After the death of Solomon, tensions between the tribes of Israel led to the creation of two kingdoms, a northern kingdom of Israel and a southern kingdom of Judah. With power divided, the Israelites could not resist invasions that dispersed many of them from Canaan. Some, such as the ten lost tribes, never returned. Others were sent to Babylon but were later allowed to return under the rule of King Cyrus of the Persians. Many upper-class people from Judah were deported to Babylonia. The memory of their exile is still evoked in the stirring words of the Psalms. But the Babylonian captivity of the people of Judah did not last. A new set of conquerors, the Persians, destroyed the Chaldean kingdom and allowed the people of Judah to return to Jerusalem and rebuild their city and temple. The revived kingdom of Judah remained under Persian control until the conquest of Alexander the Great in the 4th century BCE. It was because of the toleration of Cyrus the Great that the Jewish people were able to rebuild their temple and to have their own religion. The people of Judah survived, eventually becoming known as the Jews and giving their name to Judaism, the religion of Yahweh, the Israelite God. The spiritual dimensions of Israel perspective is perspective of the Israelites earliest times probably they probably worshiped many gods uh, the, Isra the, the Israelites at first for polytheistic including nature spirits spirits dwelling in trees and rocks for some Israelites Yahweh was the chief god of Israel at the time but Many, including kings of Israel and Judah, worshipped other gods as well. It was among the Babylonian exiles in the 6th century BCE that Yahweh, the God of Israel, came to be seen as the only God. 
uh, probably because they wanted to see themselves as a distinct people amidst those that were, they were, that were strangers in the land that they inhabited. After these exiles returned to Judah, however, their point of view eventually became dominant, and pure monotheism became to be the major tenet of Judaism at that time. According to the Hebrew conception, there is but one God called Yahweh who created the world and everything in it. Yahweh ruled the world and was subject to nothing. This omnipotent creator was not removed from the life that he had created, however, but was just a God and good God who expected goodness from his people. If they did not obey his will, they would be punished severely. Uh, but he was primarily a God of mercy and love. So the Bible says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that he has made. Each individual could have had a personal relationship with this being. Of course, as you know in the biblical script, uh, God is also a uh, genocidal figure, um, killing people um, relentlessly and ruthlessly. Uh, three aspects of the Hebrew religious tradition had special significance. Uh, the covenant, the law, and the prophets. Uh, the, the Israelites believed that during the exodus from Egypt when Moses, according to the biblical script, led his people out of bondage and into the promised land. God made a covenant or contract with the tribes of Israel who believed that Yahweh had spoken to them through a man by the name of Moses. The Israelites promised to obey Yahweh and follow his law. And in return, Yahweh promised to make special care of his chosen people, a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people. This covenant between Yahweh and his chosen people could be fulfilled, however, only by obedience to the law of God. Most important were the ethical concerns that stood at the center of the law. Sometimes these took the form of specific standards of moral behavior. He had what was called as Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. And true freedom consisted of the following God's moral standards. Voluntarily, if people chose to ignore the good, suffering and evil would follow. The Israelites believed that certain religious teachers called prophets were sent by God in order to serve as his voice to his people. The golden age of prophecy began in the mid-8th century BCE in this axial age and continued during the time when the people of Israel and Judah were threatened by Assyrian and Chaldean conquerors. The men of God went through the land warning the Israelites that they had failed to keep God's commandments and would therefore be punished for breaking the covenant. I will punish you for all your iniquities says the God of Israel. Out of the words of the prophets came new concepts that enriched the Jewish tradition. The prophets embraced a concern for all humanity. All nations would someday come to the God of Israel, they said. All the earth shall worship thee. This vision encompassed the elimination of war and the establishment of peace for all nations. And in the words of the prophet Isaiah, the text quotes, He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Although the prophets developed a sense of universalism, the demands of the Jewish religion, the need to obey God, eventually encouraged a separation between the Jews and their non-Jewish neighbors. Unlike most other peoples of the Middle East, Jews could not simply be amalgam amalgamated into a community by accepting the gods of their conquerors and their neighbors. To remain faithfully pure to the demands of their God, they might even have to refuse loyalty to political leaders. And as you will see, this becomes a problem later on.